All right, we're doing a space video today because I want to get back to that. It's been a really long time since we've done any space stuff. You guys know I like it. I ran across this video uh, just randomly on YouTube. I'm interested in learning about some other space programs because everybody knows about NASA. And while we will probably do some videos regarding NASA, I remember the, the British Space Agency was mentioned during the video I did a few months back on like the top space agencies. I want to take a look at it. I want to see what they have contributed to the space industry, space exploration, all of that stuff. So let's do it. So this video is called Black Arrow, the lipstick rocket, a very British space program. <laughs> I've learned that a very British fill in the blank is kind of like a thing over in the UK. I've seen other programs also called that before, so I think that's like a saying that you guys like to do. It puts a little nice little character spin on it. So I have no idea what the lipstick rocket is. You can tell why it's called that based on the um, picture of it. I don't really know when this took place. I'm assuming during like, the Cold War era. If it was during the Cold War era, I bet the uh, British were probably working with NASA as well on some stuff, I'm assuming. All right, so looking forward to this, my very first look into the British space program. Although it may seem as though it was a two horse race between the USA and the USSR, from the mid 1950s, a small club of nations one by one gained the ability to independently launch satellites using their own rockets. <laughs> and in chronological order, they were the Soviet Union, United States, France, Japan, China, and the United Kingdom. Holy cow, look at the dates um, on this. <laughs> There's a big disparity between France, Japan, China, and the UK. I mean, we're talking about almost a 15 year difference. Holy cow. Whilst the Americans and Soviets threw billions of dollars and rubles and the power of a state at the problem of space, the British, after the Second World War, were almost bankrupt oh, no. and shadows of their former industrial might. But they still had the brains and wanted a seat at the top table of the new world order. The price of entry to this exclusive club was a nuclear deterrent, as the US government refused hmm. to share information about the atomic bomb, on which many top British scientists had worked to develop, Britain knew that it would have to develop its own bomb and missile delivery system to match that of the Soviets and keep up with the US. Britain's heavy missile blue streak had been in slow development between 1955 and 1960, but costs overran alongside growing skepticism from the British government. Two years later, the Nassau agreement between the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan and John F. Kennedy confirmed the sale of American Polaris missiles instead as Britain's ICBM launch system. Rather than waste the millions of pounds and years of development that went into the homegrown rocket technology, the British government approved the development of Blue Streak into a satellite launcher called Black Prince. However, the cost would be significant, and neither the UK government nor any member of the Commonwealth would help fund the program. With the risk of Blue Streak going unused, British Aviation Minister Peter Thornycroft approached the French government in 1960 and offered the rocket as Britain's contribution to the new European Launcher Development Organisation, or ELDO. Blue Streak would serve as the lower stage of a joint satellite launch system called Europa. Britain's rocket engineers were back in business and Blue Streak began testing in 1964 at Woomera, South Australia. So it sounds like uh, the UK just kind of gave up on having a solo space program and decided to join forces with uh, some other countries around the world, which I guess, you know, the old saying, two heads are better than one. So if you have some allies you can trust uh, with that, apparently the US <laughs> wasn't invited to the table, um, understandably so, I guess, based, based on the uh, information he's given me here anyway. But yeah, this is... Uh, this is the remote test site covered a vast area, over 47,000 square miles or 122,000 square kilometers, over half the area of Britain. Blue Streak flew 10 times from Woomera until 1970, but in 1971, after a failed launch and review, the rocket was retired to be replaced with the French Ariane design. You know, I just thinking about that, like going, you have to go to Australia to test all of your stuff. Do they not have testing platforms in the UK? 
with that. So they now have like a launch uh, location in the UK. So they had to go all the way to Australia. <laughs> Is that where their scientists were based too? Or did they have to fly down there, you know, just to test stuff? Like that's, if they had to do like commute like that, man, that's kind of inconvenient. Maybe they were working in Australia. But Britain's dream of an independent orbital capability was not forgotten. Some hoped that Woomera would grow to become a Commonwealth spaceport, perhaps one day launching joint UK-Australia missions to the moon and beyond. Back in Britain, the engineering firm Saunders Row, later Westland, and Bristol Sidley, bought out by Rolls-Royce in 1968, still had contracts to develop a smaller launcher that would be compatible with the ELDO lower stage. The project was named Black Arrow, following the Ministry of Supplies Convention of Rainbow Codes, assigning a colour and a noun to research programmes. Black Arrow would be as much a technical demonstrator to show the viability of the HTP kerosene-powered engines developed for the Black Knight as it was a potential commercial launch system. The rocket would burn 85% high-test peroxide or HTP and kerosene on the two lower stages, something that the British had perfected and would use a solid fuel third stage to deliver a small satellite to orbit. HTP was originally developed by the Germans in World War II for bipropellant rockets like the Walter HWK 509 in the Messerschmitt ME163. High-test peroxide is the same as people use to bleach their hair blonde, but instead of the 2 to 4% concentration for hair bleach, HTP is between 70 and 98%. Although not as reactive as some of the other oxidizers like hydrazine, it is one of the easiest to handle. It doesn't give off poisonous fumes and if spilt, it can be washed away with a hose and water, but it will still set fire to or explode anything organic it touches and is liable to spontaneous combustion at temperatures above 150 degrees Celsius. What? Black Arrow played to British strengths. HTP fuel technology had already been developed in experimental British submarines and torpedoes. The fuel also has the advantage of not requiring cryogenic storage and all the extra handling and insulation that goes with it. Okay, Very so so what does what's the fuel that NASA uses then? I'm assuming they don't use HTP because he just said it doesn't require cryogenic storage. I feel like I hear about cryogenic stuff all the time with NASA, so they must have something that requires that. Is it, um, you know what, I've seen a lot of NASA documentaries and stuff, so I've, I'm, I feel like I, I should know what kind of fuel they use, but I, I can't think of it right now. It's convenient for launches in the hot Australian desert. It is also energy dense. Liquid hydrogen takes up 17 times the volume That's what of the same <laughs> given weight. This makes an HTP rocket much smaller and cheaper to make. As a bipropellant fuel mixture, HTP is hypergolic, meaning that it ignites on contact with kerosene when decomposed in the engine, so removing a potential engines. point of failure, namely the ignition of the fuel, and it will ignite in space where there is no oxygen. It also produced a very clean exhaust plume. Static firing tests took place at High Down wow. on the Isle of Wight, where Saunders Row were based. From here, the rocket. Sorry, I was concentrating on the clear. Plume, that's cool. So produced a. I mean, compared to what NASA's rockets look like, that's crazy. That's pretty cool looking too. The exhaust fumes coming down. It looks almost like um, crystal like in it. Well, I don't know. Crystal. It's got a very interesting look to it. Very clean exhaust plume. Static firing tests took place at High Down on the Isle of Wight, where Saunders Row were based. Oh, From right. here, the rocket was shipped to Woomera Rocket Range for the first demonstration flight on the 27th of June, 1969. Codename R0, the first- They shipped it to Australia? From here, the rocket was shipped to Woomera Rocket Range for the first demonstration flight on the 27th of June, 1969. Codename R0, the first launch carried a dummy payload, but on launch, some of the rocket vectoring nozzles started to rock backwards and forwards, causing the rocket to go into a roll oscillation. That's so weird. The exhaust fume is blowing my mind. It looks so foreign. Backwards and forwards, causing the rocket to go into a roll. I mean, look at that. It's like little tendrils hanging down. That's crazy. I've never seen that before. Full oscillation. It reached around 9,000 feet before it was destroyed by the range safety officer. The second test launch, R1, 
was almost a year later, on There's March 4, 1970. For the first time, the fairing was painted bright red for visibility, earning the Black Arrow the nickname the Lipstick Rocket. This time, the first and second stages worked exactly as planned. On the 2nd of September 1970, Black Arrow had its first chance to deliver a working satellite into orbit. R2 would carry the Orba satellite. Built from spare parts due to the project's shoestring budget, Orba was a 13 kilogram or 29 pound sphere containing an instrument to measure atmospheric density as its orbit decayed. However, during the launch, the second stage shut down 13 seconds early and Orba burned up on re-entry. Black Arrow would have to wait another year for its next launch. The R3 rocket carried a satellite that was to be named Puck after the nimble wanderer of the night in the Shakespeare play A Midsummer Night's Dream. It weighed 66 kilos or 146 pounds and was designed to test a variety of satellite systems and detect micrometeorites in low orbit. As the R3 rocket was en route to Australia, the British government announced the surprise cancellation of the Black Arrow project for so-called economic reasons. However, behind the scenes, there were other issues. NASA had offered their scout launcher for future satellites for almost free, although this offer was later withdrawn after the cancellation of the Black Arrow. And the R2 failure had so doubt regarding the Black Arrow's reliability. The, la the US is always trying to like peddle their uh, technology to countries <laughs> around the world. Lack of resources and infrequent testing also slowed down development to a crawl. There was also little in the way of any commercial prospects. In 1971, there was no satellite business as we know it now. It was too to small to launch many of the larger satellites of the day, and miniaturization of the electronics still had many years to go before commercial satellites would be small enough to make use of the Black Arrow. Also, it seems in order to placate the French with their own Diamant launcher, later to become Ariane, the British Prime Minister Edward Heath, in secret talks, offered to cancel the Black Arrow project after the UK joined the common market, suggesting that neither the UK nor the French had any further use for the Black Arrow, and effectively removing any competition for the European launch system. On being told that this would be the last launch, the team changed the name of the satellite from Puck to Prospero, another character from Shakespeare, this time the sorcerer in The Tempest, who gave up his magical powers. I feel like only the British would name their rockets after Shakespeare characters. I don't know, maybe there are other countries that have done that, I just, I'm not aware of it. A typically understated British riposte to the government of the day. Black Arrow took off for the last time on October 28, 1971, and made it into orbit with a textbook launch. As Prospero was released, the solid fuel third stage bumped and damaged one of the four communication antenna. However, the satellite functioned as intended and remained in radio contact with the British tracking station in Lasham, Hampshire for 25 years until 1996, when its mission was officially concluded. R4, the final Black Arrow and backup for the R3, was never flown. It and a spare Prospero satellite are now preserved at the Science Museum in London. The X4 satellite, which was due to be launched on the R4, was put into orbit by an American Scout D1 rocket in March 1974 from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The Black Arrow was ahead of its time. If the government had decided to continue, much like the French did, it would have been well placed for the launch of the later smaller satellites as the communications industry grew and would have kept Britain in the space race. Since 2000, the government has looked at resurrecting the program, but too many of the original personnel with the expertise have died and the facilities dismantled. Whether anything in the near future will arise remains to be seen. Ultimately, Black Arrow was one of the most economical launch systems ever developed. Because the system used the technology developed for the earlier Black Knight, the total cost of the Black Arrow program, including research and operations, was just £10 million, equivalent to around £65 million today. Just a little more than NASA pays for one seat on the Russian Soyuz to the ISS. 
And as for Prospero, it's expected to orbit until around 2070, when it will fall back to Earth to end its 100 year journey. Wow. All right, so basically the Lipstick Rocket was a satellite launcher and uh, they were so somewhat successful with it, I guess. That's a shame though that the British government decided to shut the program down and uh, basically killed any momentum that, you know, Britain had in the um, space race, if you want to call it that. I get the distinct impression though that a lot of the European countries are more inclined to pull together and, you know, do some joint projects versus kind of just having each country do their own thing. Although I know that countries like France, for instance, still has their own space program. The uh, British Space Agency, do they do anything now? Like, what are they up to currently? I know that NASA is planning to do some moon missions in the very near future, so I don't know if the UK is uh, collaborating on that at all. But I'd be curious to hear from a lot of you who live in the UK, what do you guys think about this? What do you guys think about your space program? Would you like to see the UK kind of step back into that? Or, if, or are you perfectly happy with um, you know, not being involved with that at all? I know there are a lot of different opinions. A lot of people think that we should be spending the, the time, the resources, the money, the energy on solving our current problems that we have here on Earth, which makes sense. Uh, I'm of the opinion that humans are born explorers and we do need those uh, challenges of exploration beyond the boundaries that we uh, currently know. And for us right now, that would be space and I think also the ocean as well. That's another very unexplored area. But I think it should be an exciting few years coming up with the um, with NASA getting kicked off again with the moon missions and there just seems to be some energy that's kind of getting stirred up in the whole like space industry right now. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you did, hit the like button. That does help the video reach more people. And also subscribe if you haven't done that yet. I've got links in the description and pinned comment for all my social media and my Patreon where you can go and watch a bunch of other videos that I don't put up here on YouTube. So there's a lot of content over there. So stay tuned for more space videos coming up and we'll see you next time.